starter. Hey everyone, thanks for joining uh, the Baltimore County Fire Department EMS training series. Uh, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and ICU physician at Hopkins. I'm an active volunteer at Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company and I have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Baltimore County Fire Department and the medical, direct, um, the medical director's office and Dr. Andy Pollack, on behalf of the EMS office, Director Shenning, Captain Stewart, Captain Nats, Thanks for what you guys do every day. Thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. A big shout out to Ashley Brooks. Ashley is a volunteer, a young member and a volunteer at Pikesville who helps us with our IT platform. Ashley had a baby this past week, pretty incredible. And she asked for a day off of this training. So we felt obliged to give that to her. And as a result, I have to run the IT platform. And this is important to you because if you want your CEUs, Keep an eye out on the chat at some point during this talk. I'll put a link in the chat or I'll try to put a link in the chat. And I will also let you know when I do it, click on the click on the link, give us some information and we will make sure that you get your MIM CEUs. Very important if you're having any problems or I'm having technical difficulties, we need to resolve the attendance record for this training prior to hanging up tonight. So please feel free to hang out afterwards and work with me to make sure that you get the link to make sure that you get your CEUs. Great. So tonight we have uh, Dr. Michael Phipps uh, with us. Dr. Phipps is an associate professor of neurology and epidemiology and public health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and director of the Brain Attack Center at the University of Maryland. His clinical focus is on treating patients with stroke and intracranial hemorrhage, as well as other types of cerebrovascular disease in the inpatient and outpatient settings. His overall research focuses on the quality and outcomes of patients with cerebrovascular disease, especially using informatics and other technologies. He also has an interest in access to care, health disparities, and health literacy for all patients. Dr. Phipps, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your knowledge and your expertise. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barinholtz, I appreciate it. And thank you all for uh, joining tonight. Um, I'm actually, um, I appreciate that introduction and also that I'm actually excited because I, I feel um, that uh, I don't get enough um, interaction uh, with the pre-hospital care. That's really um, helping and being in a major part of our, our stroke team. And so it's, a, it's a exciting for me to be able to, um, you know, to talk with you guys. You know, this platform is not my favorite way because I do like to be able to interact and really hear from you. Um, I do want to get questions. Uh, and I know that um, some of the things I may say and talk about, you may not um, know abbreviations or things like that. So please just speak up and ask um, because, you know, I don't really want this to be super formalized. I want you to really um, understand what I'm trying to talk about because I'm very excited about um, stroke uh, and stroke care. Um, and there's been a lot of advances in the last couple of years that I want to talk about and show you. Um, the other thing is, though, is that I do like it to be a little bit interactive. So I'm just going to ask you to do um, a couple of little things um, where I'm going to have a couple polls here. Um, essentially, in, in the beginning, I'm going to give you some information about how you can access it either by your phone or by a computer. And um, hopefully you can just uh, put in a couple words uh, when I'm asking or answer some of the questions. It's all anonymous. It's not for uh, any, any grading purposes. This is more for just to get people thinking about things uh, in stroke. Um, so I'm going to first uh, talk about the overview. I'm going to talk about uh, acute ischemic stroke, including large vessel stroke, which has become more prominent uh, an issue uh, these days. Um, and we can do so much about it. And then maintenance of what's called the ischemic penumbra, which is the reason that we think we can um, treat uh, stroke and actually make people much better in the early period. I'll talk about how time is brain. Uh, don't let people tell you otherwise, uh, time is brain. Even if we can treat people out to uh, longer uh, um, periods, it's still better if we do it early. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about treatment with IV TPA or uh, thrombolysis uh, and uh, endovascular treatment. Um, I'm also gonna talk about some stroke st screening and severity pre-hospital tools that you may or may not be familiar with um, and talk just a little bit about them and also about some technology advances in some near future stroke care. Um, 
so just to start to get things off, I hope you guys can see that uh, up here at the top. If you can, could go in and it's pullev.com slash Michael Phipp 350, or you can text Michael Phipp 350 to 22333. And once you join, then you can be doing this regularly. Um, and if you could just put in like, you know, stroke symptoms, common stroke symptoms that you hear about. Um, when you hear, you know, over the phone, you get a call or you see some patients, what are you thinking about some, just some common stroke symptoms? Just wanna kind of get the range of, of stroke symptoms before I start talking about it. So I'm gonna assume everybody's actively trying to get it. I, it's pollev.com, Michael Phipp 350. Uh, and then uh, Michael Phipp 350, you can text that, Michael Phipp, P-H-I-P-P -P, 350 to 22333 wants to join. Great, I love this. It definitely takes a couple of minutes though, so bear with yep. us. There you go, slurring speech, awesome. And if you put them in a single word and smash the words together, sometimes it works a little better for this. So definitely slurring speech, headaches, drift, there we go, arm drift, closed eyes, okay. So people are thinking definitely of limbs, there's drift, there's arms, there's movement. Weakness, there we go, weakness, good, eyes. Aphasia, all right, we got aphasia, drift, expressive aphasia, I'm sure that probably went together. There we go, nausea sometimes. Um, let's see, arms, if I'm missing something slurred. Again, this is fully anonymous, just give what you know out there. I want to wait for just one or two more responses. Great. Awesome. Drift. Whoa. All right. Vision irregularity. All right. Good. So problems with vision. Problems with balance. I see balance there too. Great. All right. So we're getting a lot of it. Um, I think people probably know too. Numbness can be one of the ones that comes in. Um, confusion. All right. Very good. So we're getting a lot of the, um, the ideas here. A uh, lot of thoughts, so weakness, numbness, um, drift, uh, slurred speech, aphasia. What about eye gaze? Sometimes, you know, people have different eye gaze there. And some people said vision problems, loss of vision, balance, definitely an issue. Um, confusion sometimes can happen. It's not very specific, but it definitely can happen. All right, so we're just talking about a quick case. We have a 76-year-old woman has the acute onset of left face, arm, leg, significant weakness, uh, dysarthria. Now dysarthria is speech, meaning that the, some of the words are coming out, but they're very slurred. So slurred speech or dysarthria. A right gaze deviation, meaning that they're like this and looking really strongly to the, to the side and not moving their eyes over. Uh, left visual field cut. So if you bring something over in their left visual field, they don't see that. Um, and then a left neglect. You may have heard of that term neglect, which is that they're not really paying attention to these things on the side of space. And in fact, if you came up to them, walk to them, often you'll see them go like this. And even if you came to this left side of them, they would look to the right like this, uh, trying to search for you. So we have a lot of symptoms on the left side with a right gaze deviation. And the onset is 1.5 hours ago with a uh, NIH stroke scale of 18. I'll go into that a little bit later, but that's a measure of severity. And that's a pretty significant uh, severe stroke. And, um, and what, the, what we think about it, just want you to think, what, when we see all these left-sided symptoms, what, where in the brain is it likely to be a, um, being affected? So that's gonna be the right side of the brain. So when you have all these left-sided symptoms, it tends to be the right side of the brain causing a left visual field cut, left neglect, and then left face, arm, and leg weakness with the slurred speech. In this case, our CT scan comes up. And if you look at this CT scan, which I know is probably not huge on your screens, 
Um, what we look for in this is symmetry. Is it similar on both sides? Are there big dark areas or bright areas within the brain? The bright areas would indicate hemorrhage or some bleeding. The dark areas would indicate maybe a completed stroke, an area that's affected. And so we're looking for symmetry. And in this case, it is symmetric. And there's actually no indication of stroke on this. So we would say this is normal. Now, are they still having a stroke? Yes, they are still having a stroke. And this is actually what we want to see because they're, they're having lack of blood flow to that area of the brain, but their CAT scan is not indicating that it's irreversibly damaged at that time. So this is our opportunity to do something about that. All right. So having said what I was saying about, could we try and just give one thought here about where this might uh, be affected? Is this going to be a left large vessel occlusion causing a large area of the left hemisphere to be affected? Is this a left basal ganglia internal capsule infarct, which is going to be a smaller area, but it's going to primarily cause weakness? A right MCA large vessel occlusion, where it's going to cause a large area of the right side of the brain to be affected? Again, a right subcortical, which is going to be a lot less. Or is this going to be what we call an ICH, which is an intracerebral hemorrhage? Um, but we already have the CAT scan. So I can tell you right now, right? We don't have any blood on the CAT scan. We didn't have anything there. It was normal. So give it a shot. Again, anonymous. This is all just to get you thinking, trying to think about it. I have five responses. Maybe I get two more and then I'll go to the next one. Six. One more brave soul out there want to try? All right, that's fine. We'll go on to this. Oops, what happened there? All right, let's see the responses. All right, good. So everybody got that it was on the right side of the brain, right? It was on the right side of the brain. In this case, with all of these really significant, um, uh, okay, what, um, Really, really, really significant um, uh, um, symptoms such as the left arm and leg, the visual field cut, the gaze preference, everything like that. It's going to actually be a larger area. So if this is a large vessel occlusion rather than a subcortical one, that's primarily going to cause um, a weakness there. All right. Great. I did notice a little bit in the chat. Is there something I can help with in the chat? Uh, okay, great. All right. Um, so this is what a CT angiogram. So this is a CT angiogram using a CAT scan and putting dye in, in the, the veins and taking a picture when the dye has gone throughout the veins. And this indicates here, well, you can see, uh, oh, and remember on our radiology, the right side of the screen is actually the left side of the brain and the right and the left side of the screen is the right side of the brain. So right here, this is the left middle cerebral artery, a big large artery, and that's open and that's getting blood over here to that side. But then you see this right here and you see this nice arrow showing you there's something stopping up the blood there and it's not allowing blood to flow into that area and, and it's causing a stroke. So, <clears throat> Just to back up a little bit, our stroke definition is, this is a clinical neurologic syn syndrome, okay? That occurs when blood flow to the brain is interrupted either by a blocked, which we call an ischemic stroke, or a ruptured, which we call a hemorrhagic blood vessel. So you can have your hemorrhagic stroke. And today I'm not gonna be talking about hemorrhagic stroke. That is something that we have to worry about and we have to um, uh, deal with but I'm gonna be focusing on the ischemic stroke when you have blockage and, not, and there's a lack of blood flow that's going to that brain in that area. <clears throat> I also wanna just say one quick word about TIA, transient ischemic attack, sometimes called mini strokes. Um, these are really important. This is a brief episode of a neurologic symptoms from a temporary blockage of the blood vessel to the brain. And the symptoms completely resolved but what's also important is that there's no evidence of damage on your brain imaging 
for the TIA. But the most critical thing about this is it's a warning sign of a potential or future ischemic stroke. There's no permanent ne neurologic deficits at that time. And it tends to resolve within minutes to hours. It tends to be very early. If you've gone beyond about an hour or so, you probably have damage to the brain um, with, uh, you know, that is actually an ischemic stroke. Um, the thing is, is that, can you guess which is gonna have a higher risk of having a subsequent stroke, a completed stroke or a TIA? I'm kind of leading you down the path here, but a TIA is going to be a much higher risk <clears throat> of a future, uh, actually recurrent stroke in that early period than even a completed stroke. So this is not something that we wanna take lightly. They really need to be evaluated. Some stroke statistics to get a sense of how bad this stuff is around. And I'm sure you have a sense of it, but they have about 800,000 strokes a year in the United States. About 85% of them are ischemic and 15% are hemorrhagic. On average, every 40 seconds, someone in the US has a stroke. About 7 million Americans over 20 uh, have had a stroke. So they're living with stroke. And stroke is now the fifth leading down from the third cause of death partially because we have all been doing better at recognizing them and getting them treated. But unfortunately, also partially because uh, pulmonary diseases have gotten worse and so have accidents, which have uh, gone up and gone above uh, stroke as a cause of death. So every four minutes, someone dies of a stroke and it's about eight to 12% uh, percent ischemic stroke mortality within 30 days. Um, so, but the big issue of stroke is not mortality, okay? A lot of people, especially in ischemic stroke, which is 85% of them, it's not mortality. And this is something you may be surprised about, but it's the number one cause of disability in the United States. It's the number one cause. So this is where, yes, we are trying to uh, improve death from stroke, but a big portion of what we're also trying to improve is uh, remove or de decrease disability. Dr. Phipps? Yes. There's a question in the chat. Is anything done to prevent an ischemic stroke from occurring after having a TIA with the exception of blood thinners? Great question. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> yes, there are a number of things. Uh, there are three major ways that a stroke can happen from the heart, from the large carotid arteries, or for, from the small vessels in the brain. And what we do is we evaluate those three things. If they have a major blockage in a carotid artery, they may have surgery or stenting done. If we do an EKG or a heart monitor for a period of time and find atrial fibrillation, we will put them on blood thinners, which was mentioned. Um, we'd also start them on statins. And then we manage um, risk factors, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, um, <clears throat> significantly manage blood pressure because that is a huge issue uh, when it comes to um, uh, stroke management. So yes, good question, because there are many things that we can do. And in fact, if we do all of those things together, studies have shown that we can reduce the risk of subsequent stroke by 80%, which is huge. So um, we can't neglect these TIAs. All right, now this is really critical because our big, one of our big treatments for ischemic stroke, uh, a, a clotting stroke, is to give a clot-busting medication called TPA. If we give a clot-busting medication to a hemorrhagic stroke, what do you think is going to happen? They already have a close to uh, 40 to 50 percent mortality within 30 days. We're just going to increase that possibility because we're going to cause more bleeding. Um, so. What's really important is, can we distinguish ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes clinically by just by seeing them in the field or seeing them in the ambulance or seeing them in the emergency department? Can we determine and, and figure out if they have ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke? All right, I have my six responses, which is great. Oh, yes and no. See, this is great because everybody's learning something. All right. So at one, one point, um, it's been tried very many times. And thanks for everybody's responses. I really do appreciate it. So the answer is no, okay? Many different attempts have been 
uh, have made, been made to distinguish, but have failed. And I've been doing this for, what was it this, I figured out the other day. I'm, I'm going on my 16th year. And even so I get fooled. I'll think it's an ischemic stroke and it turns out to be hemorrhagic, or I think it's a hemorrhagic stroke, turns out to be ischemic. I'm usually right, but there are times that I get fooled and I, I, I don't know. And unfortunately it's failed. And so one of the really, really critical things about treatment is it's only reliable ways to distinguish is with a CT or an MRI of the brain. That's it. We tried, we'd love to be able to do this. We'd love to be able to um, you know, do this more quickly, but what it makes, what it makes happen is that the CT MRI is a rate limiting step, right? We have to get that CT MRI. And it's the really big thing that we can't make any decisions about anything until we have that CT or MRI. So what does ischemic stroke look like on a CAT scan? Well, this is when it's bad. This is what we don't wanna see, right? This is a big dark area here where the arrow shows and it's showing a completed stroke and in 2021, we cannot reverse this, right? We don't have ways to reverse this to regrow new neurons. Um, so that's not good. On an MRI, it looks like this, it looks bright. Um, uh, uh, bright on a CT indicates hemorrhage, bright on an MRI, the diffusion sequence uh, means ischemic stroke. So what does it usually look like early in that ischemic stroke in that less than six hour period of time? It looks normal. And again, that's what we wanna see. We wanna see a patient that has a clinical picture of a stroke and a normal CAT scan, because at that moment, we can do something about it and potentially preserve a lot of the brain that right now is not getting enough blood flow. All right, and I will stop and see if there's any other questions. Okay, and while I'm doing that, can people give me a sense of the risk factors for ischemic stroke? What are the risk factors of patients that you would think about for ischemic stroke? Hypertension, excellent. Smoking, diabetes, some types of surgery, that is true. Atrial fibrillation, thank you. Family, that's true, you can have a family history. Uh, heredity. Good diabetes, I see. I don't know if I said that. Diabetes also. Cholesterol. Excellent. And smoking, I'm glad that came up early. Uh, sickle cell, yeah. Ooh, we're getting even some of the less common ones. That's excellent. Uh, DVT, if you have a PFO, it's true if you have a DVT. Sickle cell, smoking, diabetes, vasculitis, wow, yeah. Less common ones. People are really getting it. That's awesome. This is great. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that because you guys got really uh, the majority of them: cholesterol, heredity, uh, sickle cell, antiphospholipid. <laughs> wow. All right, somebody, some people really know their their uh, less common things here. Thank um, you. For plants in the audience. I'm sorry. Somebody asked about testosterone supplements. Testosterone supplements are. Uh, it's it's not entirely clear. Um, it's thought that they may, but the the jury's a little bit out about those. Um, all right, this is excellent. So we coagulopathy. All right, very good. So hypercoagulable state, we really say. So you've got a lot of the really common ones, and even a lot of the other ones. And what's I, I teach a lot about this, and what distresses me is sometimes people don't even say atrial fibrillation. But um, but. I'm gonna move on. So that was really good. Uh, and thanks again for everybody participating. Um, okay, hypertension, hypertension, hypertension. I keep on teaching this, but it's so true. Hypertension is huge. Now this, this slide is old and I keep on trying to find one that's a little bit better. Um, this is basically number of preventable strokes based on the you know annual strokes. Hypertension is huge. Cholesterol is not as strong a risk factor, but so many people have it. It's still a big issue. But really when it comes down to it, it's hypertension, smoking, atrial fibrillation. Also heavy alcohol use can be a, an issue. Um, uh, some of the other things are not preventable that people brought up like heredity and, um, and family histories and sickle cell and things like that. Um, but I also found this, this is actually from a Brazilian study but really shows the really, really strong contribution of atrial fibrillation 
hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, which is really a kind of a, a marker for hypertension, uh, being sedentary and smoking, right? Uh, and then having carotid stenosis and then diabetes and alcohol. So really these are the really big, big major um, issues. Yes, we do get vascularized, we do get sickle cell, we do get quite, uh, hypercoagulable states. Um, they're just a lot less common. Uh, BFAST, I'm sure you're all aware now of BFAST <laughs> um, instead of FAST, which we were using before, um, meaning balance, eyes, uh, face, arms, speech, time to call uh, for the ambulance. Um, so um, <clears throat> this is because we're really trying to capture some of those uh, posterior circulation strokes, which are missed by FAST. Uh, so uh, BFAST, balance, and eyes are, are, are important too. Um, again, stroke warning signs. The main idea here is if it's sudden, right? Really the suddenness is what defines stroke because it is a clot or a hemorrhage and it happens quickly and causes significant neurologic problems. Um, the headache tends to come with the more hemorrhagic ones, but you can get that with um, ischemic as well. And then vision, confusion, trouble speaking, numbness, weakness, things like that. All right, large vessel ischemic stroke. I'm gonna just quickly check. Thanks, uh, um, Dr. Barinholtz for, for uh, monitoring the chat there. Um, yeah, large yeah. vessel ischemic stroke, I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, so this is a, an image of a, a cerebral angiogram. So this is um, uh, when they actually put a catheter into the body and inject dye and the dye goes up and they can do a basically X-ray movie of the dye as it moves up. And this is showing you a point at which the dye has gone up. What's the, remember the left, even on the right side of the screen, it's the left internal carotid artery and it's going up and that forms the anterior cerebral artery, which goes up this way. And then the middle cerebral artery, which goes this way and should be providing blood flow over here, but is stopped up by something right there. Okay. In these cases, we do have possibility of thrombectomy and the, Areas of potential thrombectomy that we look at are the internal carotid artery at the distal portion of it, the M1, uh, which is a part of the middle cerebral artery, or an M2. An M2 just indicates the area where it's branched. The M1 is the main branch. M2s are when it's branched once. It has, and it can have two or three branches, but the M2, but the point is that every time you branch, it gets to be a smaller and smaller blood vessel and the catheters can't really get up there and the risks of rupturing or causing problems with the vessel versus actually getting a clot out of there goes up. We also do look at the, what's called the basal artery, the artery in the back of the brain. We don't have as great evidence for doing that, but patients that have a basal artery occlusion do so poorly that we do it sort of compassionately and to give them a chance uh, to improve because otherwise um, they, they have uh, very, very poor outcomes. Okay, now we're talking about this and there's something that's called cortical signs, which is means that, that <clears throat> there's areas on the outside of, uh, uh, of the brain that are called the cortex. And those areas um, can have uh, injury that will cause symptoms that might indicate that large vessel occlusion. And this is a little bit more difficult. So um, this is not typically uh, explained, but what kind of things would indicate, potentially indicate a large vessel occlusion. Okay, dysarthria. Global neurologic effects, okay. So these are things that are affecting the cortex, which I recognize a lot of people would, wouldn't know all these things. Um, so how about this? I'm gonna go on because this one is a little bit more difficult. I'm gonna go on uh, and I'm gonna go here and talk about them. So the things that indicate potentially a large vessel occlusion would be a higher severity score, the NIH stroke scale score, and then what we call cortical signs. So people mentioned these before, may not have recognized that they, that you need to involve the cortex to have these problems. So aphasia, which is different from dysarthria. Dysarthria is a slurring of your speech because of a motor problem, a muscle problem. Aphasia is when you can't express or get words out or you can't understand. 
So you can't either express or you can't understand. So aphasia is in the cortex, not the inner part where there are smaller strokes occur, but it, it involves the larger areas on the outside. Neglect, where you don't pay attention to, to one side of space. Um, visual field cut so that you don't see anything and you don't recognize that you can't see anything, but you, 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 you have a visual field cut where you won't be able to see something in that size. And then gaze deviation, because there's an area in the frontal uh, lobe that's called the frontal eye fields. And if that gets injured, it causes a gaze deviation. For small vessel strokes, you get isolated weakness and or numbness, dysarthria, but no cortical signs, and, or you can have isolated vertigo. So small in the back of the brain and the cerebellum can cause that as well. Um, but one of the critical things here is that weakness, numbness, and dysarthria can be seen in both, okay? So weakness, numbness, and dysarthria does not help you distinguish a small vessel and a large vessel stroke. The cortical signs uh, tend to help you distinguish. Now they're not perfect because you can have aphasia and not have a large vessel stroke. You can still have a small vessel stroke. But if you have a number of these things together, it does help you, especially if it's with weakness. Now, did I see something come through? Yeah, there's a question on the chat. It's, yeah, but people can private message. So yeah, the only thing I see is, can the doctor elaborate on neglect? Certainly, okay. Um, and uh, someone is saying uh, aphasia is more uh, cognitive than neuromuscular, which is correct. This is a specific um, area of the brain that is um, language uh, based. And I just wanna tell people, the one way to really think about aphasia is if you didn't speak a language and were dropped in the middle of the country, you could understand the, the sounds of the voice. You could uh, know if they're upset or angry. You, you could understand maybe their hands, but you couldn't understand the content of the words and you couldn't be make yourself known by any content of the words. That's what aphasia is like. And it's not slurring, it's just that you don't understand what they're saying, but you also can't say the things that you want to say. You can't get the stuff out. Um, neglect is that you, um, when you're getting alerted or you're being asked, you don't pay attention. And people can get such severe neglect that they actually don't recognize their own left hand. Literally, they cannot recognize their own left hand. You can put it up in front of them and they don't think that it's, they think it's the person holding it up. It's their hand um, because they don't pay attention. Their, their brain has stopped paying attention to the left side of space. They will actually go and um, shave the right side of their face and leave the left because they don't even notice that that area of, of their face uh, still has beard on it. So um, it's a, it can be, and that's, that's a severe example. Um, but many times you have to get people who have neglect um, to pay attention to that side. If you call them from the left, and it's usually a left neglect. If you call them from the left side, um, they often will look to the right, looking for you over there and not recognizing that there is a left side of space. So it's a little strange, but once you see it, you, you know it. Thanks for these questions. I, I love to talk about this stuff. So, um, all right, ischemic penumbra and collateral circulation. The reason that we think we can treat stroke, especially early, this is the main idea. When you have that blockage of blood flow to the brain, there's an area core that is irreversibly injured. And as I said, in 2021, we cannot improve that right now. Hopefully we will in the future, but right now we can't, it's irreversible. But then there's an area around that we call the penumbra. Um, and that area is an area where it's not getting enough blood flow to function appropriately, but it's getting enough blood flow to stay alive. So it's, it's staying alive. And if we can restore blood flow to it, it can stay alive and start um, functioning again. And, and the things that maintain that penumbra uh, are what's called collateral circulation. And collateral circulation to the affected cerebral artery territory is critical because otherwise neurons begin to die within minutes of cessation of blood flow. 
the ability of those collateral vessels to provide that blood flow to effective vascular territory varies really tremendously between patients. There's variations in the anatomy of the cervical and the cerebral blood vessels. There's variations in blood pressure or their cardiac output. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we want people's pressures actually to be high when they're having ischemic stroke because the blood has further to go because it's basically taking a longer route to get to that same area and provide some flow, at least enough flow to keep that area alive. I think of it as somebody hanging off the edge of the cliff and as time passes, another finger goes off, another finger goes off. And what we wanna do is pull that person back up from the cliff. And these collaterals can arise at two levels. One is called the circle of Willis and then there's what's called leptomeningeal or peel collaterals. So the circle of Willis is um, connections between different blood vessels that go up into the brain. The internal carotid arteries are your two big carotid arteries on the sides of your um, uh, the sides of your neck, and then you have two vertebral arteries and the basal artery that comes up the back, and they provide some collateral flow. So if I have a blockage right here, and if any of you guys you know do plumbing or anything. I get a blockage right here, and, but I have blood flow coming up this way. This can go across here and blood flow can actually get into this middle cerebral artery and supply um, some, you know, the, the brain there, whereas this area can't get it up there. Or it could come from the backside and go up and provide some flow. Now, if it's the middle cerebral artery that's blocked, this kind of thing is not gonna work. This is an example of what it looks like. And here's an example of the blood flow going up on the left side, goes all the way up, crosses, and goes into that right, oops, sorry, goes into the right side and is providing blood flow to keep that area alive, at least for now. But then there's these things that are called leptomeningeal collaterals. These are from other uh, blood vessels that come all the way around. And they look like this. So you have a blockage here in your right, excuse me, your left middle cerebral artery where the yellow is. And then look at all these blood vessels that come around here. There's still not enough right here. This should look like this, but there is some. And if we look at a later period of time, it starts filling in there. And even in the, the part where it's supposed to go back into the veins, it's still filling in there. So it's getting enough flow, just enough to keep it alive, but this person's not gonna have function of that area of the brain. Here's another example where there's a blockage and you see a dynamic movie as, of the blood flow as it goes through. Those are called collaterals. And even on a CT angiogram, which is not dynamic like that movie, you can see evidence that some of that uh, contrast is getting over here. So this is actually a good sign. So if you, if you, you know, are seeing a patient on an outside, you know, place and you're helping with transferring them over or something like that to our place, it may be because we see these collaterals and say, they have a chance to keep that area alive till they can get to us and we can try to get that clot out. Um, unfortunately, the main thing of this slide is to say, they will not preserve the ischemic penumbra indefinitely. And if we do something like drop the blood pressure, we may actually take away the compensation and uh, uh, make the area of re irreversible infarct larger. So we don't wanna treat the blood pressure too aggressively in early ischemic stroke. Um, and this is it. Each 30 minutes, we have 10% loss of neurons. So every minute matters as the, the more, the earlier and earlier and earlier that we can move. And that, again, this is where, you know, I have to say thank you because a lot of what you do in moving these patients quickly to the area that they can get treated, you are really doing a huge part of, of helping them because every 30 minutes you lose 10% more. I'll stop for a second if there are any questions. Let me just quickly check, okay. Let me talk about IVTPA, which is one of our big treatments here. Oops. Uh, before I do that, I just have to say one thing. We have a measurement of severity in the NIH stroke scale, which I'll show you 
a little bit about in a minute. But then we have a measure of disability after all of those things happen, right? And that's called the modified Rankin scale. Um, it's a short scale. Basically, zero is no symptoms. One is you have a little bit of symptoms, but can do everything else that you used to be able to do. Two is a, a slight disability. You may not be able to drive, may not be able to, to work, but you could still look after your own affairs without assistance. Three is moderate disability, uh, but can walk without assistance. Four is moderately severe. You need help walking. Five is severely um, uh, bedridden, uh, you know, severe disability with bedridden, and six is dead. And just the reason that there's two different colors here is that zero to two is really our goal. We're trying to keep people in that zero to two period of time. Of course, zero is the best. One is even better, you know, is great. But even with two, we think is, is better than being in that three to six. So when we do any studies of this treatment of stroke, we look at trying to see how many people we can take to being zero to two rather than three, four, five, and six. And in IV TPA, it works by dissolving blood clots, improving blood flow to the brain. And in 1996, they approved it up to the three hour window. And it was later shown to improve outcomes up to the four and a half hour window. Uh, and different studies using multiple methods uh, describe recanalization rates of 30 to 60% in that six to 24 hours after TPA. That doesn't mean that 30, 60% get better, but it does mean that you get recanalization. I like this picture because it's a visual representation. If we gave 100 stroke victims, you know, it within the three hours, um, who would do what? And it's this, you know, this, um, uh, you would have 13 that would be either normal or near normal, 19 that would be better than if you didn't get the TPA. You have all of these people who wouldn't be any different if they didn't get TPA or did get TPA. And then you'll have one that'll be uh, dead or severe uh, disability with IC8 with an intracerebral hemorrhage, two that would be worse because of intracerebral hemorrhage, and then others that have some um, intracerebral hemorrhage that didn't make them worse. Um, so overall, there is a risk, but overall your chances of doing better with IV TPA or, or clot busting medication um, is, is, is good. Now the NIH stroke scale is different from the measure of disability. This is how severe are you when you are having that initial stroke? And it's, and a zero means that you're having no problems, right? Well, not necessarily because it doesn't measure everything. So I don't wanna say that you're not having any problems, okay? Um, but it, it measures a lot. But zero is the least severe and, uh, and technically it, because some things you can't test if other things are positive. So somewhere, I'm just gonna tell you, somewhere around uh, 28 to 30 is probably the highest uh, level of the NIH stroke scale. Um, essentially, if they have all of these things that are doing really poorly. Um, anytime you get into uh, above about a seven or an eight, you're getting into that moderate um, uh, NIH stroke scale and above about um, 15, uh, we can consider severe, um, even lower than that, uh, severe. So, so for TPA, you need to have a clear diagnosis of ischemic stroke. You don't think it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage and have what we call a disabling deficit. Somebody has just numbness, most of the time we don't consider that disabling and think that the risks might outweigh the benefits. Um, but if somebody happens to be a pianist and they just have a little bit of weakness in their hands, that might be disabling to that person. Um, so the onset lasts no normal about less than three and a half hours because you need to have some time to be able to get TPA by four and a half hours and no hemorrhage on head CT. Um, problem is that there's a number of possible contraindications to, um, to TPA um, because of bleeding risks, uh, having surgery, if you have um, any uh, previous bleeding in the past, and the time window, it makes it so only about 5 to 11% of the 680,000 acute ischemic stroke uh, patients treated with IV TPA do that time window. Um, so it's very frustrating that we can only do a few. 
Um, the other is that IVTPA treatment associated with lower recanalization rates for more proximal large vessel occlusions. The um, distal internal carotid artery or proximal M1 occlusion um, are unlikely to dissolve uh, with TPA alone. And large clot burdens greater than eight millimeters are less likely to respond to IV TPA alone. And 43% of large occlu uh, vessel occlusions involve clots greater than eight millimeters in length. So it doesn't mean that you don't give IV TPA, it just means that that may not be enough. And that's part of the reason we're talking today. You can see on this graph, this graph means probability of recanalization, meaning uh, this is a better chance of recanalization going upwards. And then this is the length of your clot. And once you get to that seven or eight, you see that the probability of opening up that blood vessel with just the, the clot busting medication goes really down very low. All right, so I've given you a ton, I know, um, but I have, I have some more and it's gonna get uh, even more exciting. I'll show you a little video in a second. All right, let me tell you about the mechanical thrombectomy. Um, I'm sure you know all about a lot about cardiac stuff. Um, well, people thought that in the brain we could do the same thing that we do in hearts, but didn't quite work out that way. So they tried balloon angioplasty, um, didn't really help in some cases hurt. Um, then uh, came along this thing called a mercy retriever, which is a corkscrew. Um, which actually did open up blood vessels, but didn't improve patient outcomes. Uh, the penumbra was one where it, it, the idea was you basically had a vacuum with a, uh, a separator, something that would break up the clot, and then you would vacuum up the pieces and pull it out. And again, it did open up some blood vessels, but didn't really help people. And then we got something called the stent retriever. And the stent retriever, which is instead of putting a stent and leaving a stent up in the blood vessel, we actually put the stent up there and then pull out the stent and pull the clot and everything out of the body. So you do not detach the stent and leave it there. You pull it back out. Um, it looks like this, or this is one example of the stent retriever. And I wanted to show you a video. Now this video does have audio, but I think he's really boring. So I'm gonna narrate it. Can you see the video, Dr. Varenholz? Perfect. Okay. So this is like looking in that carotid artery, you have a wire. Um, it's a, a fairly soft wire that goes up and helps you because you can turn it into the right spot uh, in the blood vessel. You actually push it past the clot. And a lot of people ask me, yes, can you break off the clot and things like that? You could possibly, but it doesn't happen that often, fortunately. Um, usually once you get this passed, um, uh, it, you can usually keep it mostly intact. Um, you then guide this little micro catheter. It's a small catheter and, and you need, need to get it past the clot. And you're going to see in a minute why you need to get it past the clot. Because now you've taken the wire out, you're actually putting in, and this is all starting from the groin and going all the way up to the brain. Um, you put in this little squunched up stent. It's, it's smashed inside that microcatheter. And then when you pull back the microcatheter, it opens up the stent and it can make a channel through that clot. And you do tend to see this channel open up in the clot. You give it a couple minutes to let that stent really grab the clot. Um, and, but the good thing is, is those couple minutes, you're getting some blood flow there. And now you briefly occlude by ballooning it open. And now they actually take this vacuum right up to the clot and pull it all the way out and all the way out of the body. And that opens up and allows blood flow to get into the, the brain there. Um, it's really phenomenal. And if you guys haven't ever seen it, um, uh, it's, it's incredible to actually sit there and see somebody who can't speak, can't move their right side, um, you know, uh, um, uh, is looking to the looking to the left, and then you take it out, and all of a sudden they're moving their arm and they're speaking to you. Um, we call it the Lazarus effect, and we actually do see this happen. Um, I'm not going to get too much into these trials, um, but uh, sometimes I think people like to see a little bit of data here. But essentially, this the the real trial data came out in 2015. So if you've been working in this for a while. 
you can see why all of a sudden this has become a huge shift um, in what we're doing because it's really, really still somewhat recent. It's only six years ago. Um, so pooled data from five trials, looked at 1,287 patients, and they found that it's significant reduced disability at 90 days compared to the control, basically compared to not doing it. Um, and this was with IV TPA giving thrombolysis and doing the thrombectomy. So it's not, it's not in place of that, it's IV TPA or clot busting medication and doing a thrombectomy. Uh, and the number needed to treat to, for that invest, endovascular therapy to reduce disability by one level on the, the disability scale was 2.6, which to translate is if I take three patients in, 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 into the thrombectomy suite, then one will become, uh, will go from being dead or disabled to alive and independent out of those three. I may get two also, it's possible, but at least one of those three will become alive and independent versus um, dead, and dependent, dead and, and severely dependent. Oops. Um, question in the chat about how often do you do the stent procedure? Uh, <laughs> all the time. We are extraordinarily busy. <laughs> we, when I first started here in 2013, um, at the University of Maryland, we did 35 of these three thrombectomies. We are now on order to be doing about 200 of them uh, a year. That was a, for, for the year. Um, so, uh, uh, so we're not at quite at one a day, um, but we're over uh, um, doing, you know, 200 out of our 365 days, somewhere around that. So pretty, we, we you know, we would like to do more. Um, of course, we, we're not hoping people have large vessel occlusions. I don't want to, to, to say that, but you know, we like to capture them in a good period of time where we can get them and actually improve them. It'll be interesting um, to see how many increase with the adoption of the MIMS protocol, right? Because there's, there's more referral now for the large vessel occlusion protocol. There is, and I'll talk a little bit about the bypass um, protocol. Great. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later because I know that's critical. Um, and Dr. Phipps, there's another question. When a TIA is detected, when a TIA is detected, is the stent procedure performed? So if it's a TIA and somebody has is recovering or is doing uh, very well, um, typically they don't have a large vessel occlusion and um, it's a little complicated, but if they do have a large vessel occlusion, and they're doing really well where they have almost no symptoms or have very little symptoms, we actually don't know quite what to do with those patients yet. There are active ongoing trials right now where some are getting the treatment and some are not, and we wanna see who, who's gonna do better. So that's actually a, a very clever question um, because we don't know if they do have a large vessel occlusion. Typically TIAs do not have a large vessel occlusion. Okay, um, so, uh, so this is quick though. This is symptom onset. Well, it really should be last known well. Uh, 4.75 hours, right? That did, uh, which is pretty fast if you think about all the things that need to happen. These are the trials and the number needed to treat. I'm not gonna get into that, but I do wanna show this graph. Um, this is, this is symptom onset to reperfusion time in minutes. So as you go up here, this is longer and longer reperfusion time. As you go across here, this is the percentage that do really well, that disability of zero to two. So as you go across, they do really well. So when we have lower onset to reperfusion times of getting that clot out, you can see you have upwards of 50, 60, even maybe 70% of people doing well and becoming zero to two, that's huge. I don't think that's the actual number probably. It's probably somewhere in the middle, about 50 to 60%, but still that means almost one in two patients we can uh, treat and do can do really well. But it's gotta be in that early period of time because if we're getting people outwards of uh, you know, 400 minutes, you're seeing that they really just don't do as well. So again, time is brain, everything has to be early. So having said that, all of those were within six hours of treatment, all of those studies. 
But then in 2017 and 18, they looked at it beyond six hours and said, well, maybe there's some people that keep those collaterals and can do well after that six hour period. And so Dawn and Diffuse, and I don't wanna get into this, this is too much uh, information, but the main thing is they went out six to 24 hours or six to 16 hours and said, let's use a calculation. Now this, this program took 10 years to create, um, but many of you may have heard of it called Rapid. It's, a, it's an algorithm that takes a certain type of CT scan called a CT perfusion, and it is able to calculate those things that I told you about. The core, which is irreversible and we can't save, which you see here in the pink, and then the penumbra, which you see in that greenish color, which is the area that's at risk, but isn't irreversible yet. And when you see a map that comes out, you see that they'll give you a calculation of about 23 milliliters that is irreversible. We cannot change that. But then there's a mismatch of 105 millimeter milliliters. This is still at risk, but isn't dead yet, all of that area. And so what we wanna to try to save is that 105 milliliters. We're, this one's done, the 23 is done, we can't get that, but maybe we can save this 105 milliliters. And that's where, and that's what we do is we select out using this, those patients that will do the best that probably have great collaterals um, and their blood pressure hasn't been dropped, et cetera. And what they did, and I want to point a couple things out here, is that they they did this and they found these small cores, okay? These are eight milliliters or nine milliliter cores, right? These are small areas where they were irreversibly injured. Um, but look at this outcome. If you do the thrombectomy, you have almost 50% that have a good outcome versus 13 if you don't or 45% versus 17 if you don't. Those are huge numbers, huge. I mean, we are dramatically improving these people's lives if you do that. So much so that this actually is now level 1A evidence, level 1A evidence, the top evidence that we can, meaning it is standard of care and that we have to consider this in patients. Don't, doesn't matter what hospital they go to. It has to be considered in patients that have a large vessel occlusion and are within this period of time. So it's really critical that this is something that we have to really change our whole mindset about, which I think many of us have, that large vessel occlusions we can do something about. So this is our case, the patient that we talked about at the beginning, 76 year old. Um, and this is what her scan looked like, right? Blockage, look at this area that doesn't get any blood flow. And 30 minutes later, it's pulled out and there's blood flow coming up here. Hey, Dr. That's what it looks. Can you go back and just hit the case scenario? Because a number of people probably joined a bit later. Oh, certainly. I'm sorry. Thanks. 76 year old had left face and arm significant weakness, dysarthria, a gaze deviation, a visual field cut, and were neglecting, not paying attention to the left side. A severity of 18 on the NIH stroke scale, which is severe, and a normal CAT scan at the beginning. And then this is the area where blood flow is restored within 30 minutes. That doesn't mean 30 minutes of the onset. That means 30 minutes of getting to the suite and opening it up. That's what it looks like uh, pulled out the clot. And then this is the only area that ended up being irreversibly affected. And they had a uh, modified ranking of one, which means a slight disability, but able to carry out all um, activities that you did before the stroke. Um, so just a slight uh, symptoms that they had. Um, so doing very well. Let me just talk a little bit about the capability of Maryland hospitals and who can do these types of thrombectomies I'm talking about. So there are the comprehensive stroke centers, and this is complete care for ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke patients. These uh, are thrombectomy capable, have neurosurgery that can do any of the neurosurgical um, procedures that might be needed, 
They also deal with aneurysms and subarachnoid hemorrhages. And there are three in the state currently, the University of Maryland Medical Center, Johns Hopkins Hospital, and Johns Hopkins Bayview. And these are all comprehensive stroke centers and they can do the whole range of uh, cerebrovascular stroke care. There's also what is called a thrombectomy capable center, which is um, a, a designation come up, I think in 2018, um, that has thrombectomy, cap th thrombectomy capability. Uh, neurosurgery is not often in-house and is within two hours. So any emergent um, neurosurgery is, is not uh, uh, likely to happen there. Not necessarily complete hemorrhagic stroke care, uh, for, like doing coiling or acute treatment of aneurysms um, and not necessarily having vascular surgery for uh, carotid end artery and stenting. Now it might have these things, but it doesn't have to have these things as the comprehensive stroke center does. And the only one that I know of that's currently designated in the state um, is uh, Sinai Hospital. Um, so these are the four areas that can do thrombectomy. Now, having said that, this is Baltimore County I'm talking to, um, there is one, uh, I, um, Suburban Hospital has some capability down in Montgomery County to do thrombectomies. And um, I am aware that uh, there's a hospital um, in East uh, Baltimore County that uh, may soon also become either thrombectomy capable or a comprehensive stroke center. But I, I don't know that for sure, so I'm not gonna name any hospitals right now. Um, so this was a study that we conducted through uh, from between Hopkins and University of Maryland and Sinai. Um, and essentially this is the bypass that we mentioned before, which MIMS has put out. So if, if, if within 30 minutes of one of these comprehensive or thrombectomy capable centers um, that they would bypass a primary stroke center. And this is kind of just to give you a sense of the map of what areas are going to what hospitals. Uh, so South and west of the city tends to come to University of Maryland and um, Sinai in the Northwest uh, and Bayview in the Northeast and then sort of some of the centrally located ones to, to downtown Hopkins. Um, this will be, I think has been presented at MIMS, but uh, um, this is, uh, will be, well, we're hoping we're close to having it actually presented as a paper. Um, so uh, we'll let you know if that uh, gets published. Um, so anyway, just to give a sense and basically just want to tell you that the, the high level is that um, uh, nobody really missed getting a throm thrombolysis or TPA window by doing the bypass. Um, and many patients got more thrombectomy than they did if they went um, through to a primary stroke center. So um, seems that it, it, it worked well and it is working well, I should say. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay. No, I don't see any questions right now. Okay. Uh, I think there might've been one that I didn't. Okay, uh, great. So um, snaking the clot, somebody says, I love it. <laughs> All right, uh, stroke screening and uh, severity pre-hospital tools. Um, so one that you know is relevant to this bypass that you likely know is the Los Angeles Motor Score uh, created at UCLA a, a while ago. Um, uh, fairly straightforward in terms of looking for facial droop, arm drift, and grip strength. Um, and we are now with the uh, um, bypass looking at a four of, or five of this motor score, uh, motor scale uh, to have them bypassed. Um, this is uh, from 2008, but in terms of sensitivity and specificity for a uh, lamb's cutoff, um, specificity means if you find something, that it is, um, it, it's likely to be that actual thing that you're looking for. Sensitivity is um, how well does it capture, even if it ends up um, capturing a lot of things that aren't real, does it capture it? Um, and uh, so uh, it turns out that's why we use four or five because your sensitivity and your specificity are highest up here, whereas there, it's not so clear in lower uh, motor scores for, and that it, this is for a large vessel occlusion, not for a stroke, but for a large vessel occlusion. There's also one called RACE, a rapid, a rapid arterial occlusion evaluation scale. It's more complicated than LAMS and incorporates the things we talked about, gaze deviation, aphasia, 
and even agnosia, which, you know, is very, it's difficult to determine. Uh, uh, a stroke is likely with a score above one and LVO is likely a score above five. Again, one of the things is it's just more difficult and takes more time to do an evaluation with this. Um, but you can see it, it crosses well in terms of its sensitivity and specificity. Um, <clears throat> uh, this means that, you know, uh, the specificity, it's more and more likely a, a large vessel occlusion um, and is not going to give you a lot of non-large vessel occlusions. That's what it shows, but it's a lot harder to do. Um, I'm just going to skip that. Okay, Cincinnati pre-hospital scale, um, uh, facial, looking at facial droop, arm drift, and speech, kind of, kind of like our fast, essentially, using a, a fast there. Um, th this is one of the first ones that was being used, but it is limited by the lack of severity. So um, it, you, you could just have this. And if you remember, I said subcortical stroke can have weakness and numbness and dysarthria. And so it's not really as specific here. Um, it really helps to identify a stroke, not necessarily large vessel. And then there's other scales, fast ED, pass, and uh, van. Uh, I think I saw something come through in the chat here. Um, and then, uh, uh, okay, um, I'll answer that later. Um, uh, so then the other thing, just remember the NIH stroke scale is obviously one that you can be used as a stroke severity scale, but it does take a lot longer. It definitely takes some training and there's a lot more to do if you're doing that in the pre-hospital setting. Um, and is used probably practically not very useful. Uh, I just will say that as the score goes up, the higher scores have a much, um, uh, uh, association with mortality, 30-day uh, mortality. Um, and this is the part, I don't know if you can see the red greens here. Um, I'm a bit colorblind, so it's a little tough for me, but I can see them. But if you can, uh, the greens are alive and the uh, reds are dead. And you can see that there's a high proportion and there's more that occur in the in the more minor strokes um, than some of those severe strokes. So those with large vessel occlusions are expected to be most of the time greater than six. So that's gonna be this portion here. Um, and then this is acute ischemic stroke mortality by the NIH stroke scale. And it kind of shows you how, as you go up on that NIH stroke scale. And again, these patients, this doesn't, this N doesn't really count because most of these are probably not correct uh, NIH stroke scores. Um, so there's a comparison done, and I just want to kind of point this out um, here that for the example, the LAMS has, you know, a, a moderate uh, sensitivity and specificity for LVO, but to be honest, a lot of these are not um, that much better. Uh, this, um, the race score does get to 87% specific specificity, meaning when you bring them with that race score, we're going to be high, you know, there's a better chance it's actually going to be an LVO. Um, but uh, the LAMS is so much easier <laughs> that um, at this time, that's what we're using. And, and maybe there'll be a point, which I hope we can have an app or something where the input is so much, is a lot easier and therefore can do some of these calculations themselves. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but again, this was just uh, a comparison of these pre-hospital severity scales. Um, just looking at the time here. And um, uh, a lot of them surprisingly found a lot of the pre same predictive value. Um, uh, you know, on the margins, it could really matter that you would be transferring fewer patients if we did some of these ones that are more specific. Um, uh, but right now, um, we're also finding that we get a lot of hemorrhages that sort of benefit from being at the comprehensive stroke centers as well. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of those right now. Okay. Um, technology advance. I'm going to just go through some of this stuff, which is, I think is kind of exciting. You may know uh, or may know not, not know about. Um, one is telestroke. We are doing more telestroke. We have uh, two and we're working on a third telestroke uh, site, um, which this is the opportunity to have video conferencing, kind of like what we're doing now. Uh, believe it or not, we started using Zoom in 2016 to do telestroke to um, other emergency departments uh, for telestroke. And uh, 
we can actually control a camera on a cart and be able to zoom in, zoom out, look at different people um, and look at down at the legs, look at the arms, uh, look at the pupils um, using this. And nobody on the other end has to actually do anything. We can zoom into the, the cart without them even touching it, um, which makes it really quick and fast. And when we're talking about time, it's really important. Um, and this is an example of what might be seen and what the patient might see. Uh, mobile stroke unit, this might be relevant and interesting to you all. There's a question in the chat that said, this is a 2012 study, anything more recent? <laughs> well, oh, yes, it, it will. I, uh, for, for stroke, uh, for telestroke, tele uh, yes, uh, there are uh, some more recent tell us joke uh, that, that are showing uh, major effects. I have to uh, update that, that one slide. Thank you. Tough crowd. <laughs> um, um, okay, so uh, mobile stroke unit. Uh, uh, this is uh, developed to combat pre-hospital delay. Um, they have a CT scanner, a, a CT tech, uh, often a nurse uh, par uh, paramedic and a point of care lab there um, within the mobile stroke unit. Um, in this, in different situations, they have a neurologist on board or by telestroke. Um, so actually having an iPad or other device within the, the ambulance itself. Um, and this is a small bore CT that's actually within the, um, the ambulance. Uh, studies has shown notification to needle time 25 minutes less, the rate of TPA increased by 12%. Um, and if a CTA is done, they had lower door to groin time of 93 to 200 minutes. However, one of the issues is that you kind of need a lot of these stroke units um, really to have an effect because one can go off and end up with a mimic for a stroke while a real stroke's over here and then you don't have that ambulance to be able to take care of them. And also, um, unless you have it by telestroke, it's a li little bit limited about having a neurologist on board. Um, and also having a nurse uh, available. So there is some, some push, but interestingly, we just had the International Stroke Conference and this is a, a, a virtually, <laughs> so this is a picture of my screen watching uh, the International Stroke Conference. And we have, so this is hot off the press from last week, um, data that showed that when they had mobile stroke use, uh, units versus uh, standard management, they had 17% more treated with TPA, 97 versus 80%. 30% more treated within that golden hour of last known well. They had 33% within, uh, within the hour of last known well um, versus 3% uh, that went to the hospital and got it there. Significantly improved patient centers outcome, 10% more with uh, that modified Rankin of zero or one at 90 days, 43 versus, 40, uh, excuse me, 53 versus 43%. And the results uh, it's similar in all TPA treated uh, and all ischemic stroke patients. And there were no safety issues with only 9% minics in both and 2% with the symptomatic uh, intracerebral hemorrhage in each group. Um, it was a little unusual that it did not speed or increase endovascular therapy the, or mechanical thrombectomy that we were talking about. Um, but there's a one year follow up for healthcare utilizations ongoing. They couldn't really tell us about what the cost was and was it cost effective, et cetera. Um, but it was uh, very interesting. And I think, you know, we'll have to see uh, what goes on here in, in this region and if we uh, are able to, to move towards that. Uh, this is an example of the um, uh, small bore CT that's inside um, the ambulance. Uh, and then an example of having like telestrophy stroke with the, the um, iPad uh, going around uh, following it. Just some other interesting things. There is some Hilla stroke service that um, Dr. Barinholtz may know of from, uh, oops, from uh, uh, Hopkins actually, where they took the uh, operator, the interventionalist, and they actually took him uh, to um, another hospital uh, instead of taking the, the patient to a different hospital. The, the, the one doing the procedure actually went to um, the other hospital. Um, question is, do the go would goggles, uh, certain types of goggles that can automatically detect eye movements, which are really critical, especially for uh, posterior circulation strokes, would they um, be able to be used by either uh, ED physicians or paramedics um, 
uh, EMT and uh, could we get even earlier uh, diagnosis by using um, some glasses. This again is being done uh, currently at Hopkins. Uh, there are a number of apps that are out there um, uh, and tools. Um, I use the one on the left all the time. Uh, haven't really used the other two. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also wearable technologies. Um, you know, can Google Glass uh, be something that could improve stroke care? Could this be worn, you know, in the ambulance and be able to have the uh, physician see what the, um, what's being seen on the ambulance? Um, uh, to be able to quickly uh, diagnose if you had a CT scan, then could we start TPA there uh, with that? Um, activity monitors, this is kind of a little bit more for post-stroke um, to try to keep uh, rehab uh, up. Um, there's also, interestingly, Apple Watch, which I do happen to have one, um, that can uh, detect atrial fibrillation, which is an important, um, huge risk factor for stroke. Um, and even potentially an early detection package for people at high risk um, could potentially wear like a, some sort of helmet thing that could actually diagnose it and, and say stroke is happening uh, as, at the moment it does. Uh, but that's, I think, way down the line. Um, the question whether the telestroke portable is portable enough that it can take it on calls. Um, so... The, the, the one good thing about uh, Zoom, I will say, is that it is um, uh, pretty darn good at low bandwidth situations. Um, uh, so people that have been doing that have uh, found it to work well. And I will tell you that I have been in my car in a parking lot using my hotspot, uh, my cell phone hotspot, to be actually able to zoom into a cart and see somebody in an emergency department, you know, miles away. Um, so, uh, yes, at this point, they basically make the, uh, kind of the, the high impact, uh, covers for the iPads that, um, that can, and I've heard that there's occasionally connectivity issues, but most of the time it works well. I'm guessing that was what the question was about. I suspect. Um, the only thing is, is that, you know, we always have to have some caveats, right? Beware the hype over the Apple Watch. The device could do more harm than good. Uh, may ended up the, saying that uh, young people have atrial fibrillation, um, uh, you know, when they really don't. Um, so, you know, I'm always excited about these things, but I do take it with a grain of salt and just let you know. Um, and, uh, you know, this is like some people think of mobile health technology, um, but hopefully we're really going more towards this as our mobile health technology. Um, so just quick summary, time is brain. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Time is brain, but potentially we can go out to 24 hours of last known well for thrombectomy. Faster is still better. And collaterals really may determine their outcomes. Um, so trying to get them there quickly and getting that evaluation is most important. Maryland has several CSCs uh, and uh, thrombectomy capable uh, TSCs for LVO. And you know, the bypass is in place and newer technologies hopefully will make it easier to determine the appropriate place and treatment for patients and also make it faster. Uh, so with that, I'm, uh, oops, let me go back to here and I will look here at the chat. Uh, um, all right. Um, so I, uh, yes, uh, I, somebody said also very expensive and I do think that yes, uh, for personnel wise and for the actual, uh, ambulance itself, uh, it's expensive, although the cost is coming down. Uh, again, I think that was referring to the MSU. Um, uh, the, uh, I think the, um, issue is that could you, potentially put the cost there rather than having all the patients uh, come to the emergency department and get some of that other um, uh, uh, stuff done there. Um, I do have a question and I know that many people do have this thought. So I want to, I want to, to talk about this. Um, Someone is saying, uh, explaining, can you explain the, the seemingly counterintuitiveness of hypertension being such a major offender in causing ischemic strokes? You know, one we usually think of hypertension causing a bursting of blood vessels, so hemorrhagic stroke rather than ischemic. And you mentioned higher BPs actually being positive ischemic stroke. 
And I think that that's, um, that's not an uncommon at all uh, thought or concept. Um, uh, and, and so, and, and to, to, to your point, um, hypertension is huge in hemorrhagic strokes and it is one of the most major causes of it. But what happens is, is that you actually get um, injury to blood vessels with high blood pressure. And the injury to blood vessels over time causes them to get um, areas where they can then have plaque or clots accumulate on them. Um, it also affects the heart and over time it affects the heart and leads to more atrial fibrillation and also potentially <clears throat> heart failure, which can lead to clots in the heart. And so <clears throat> even over time, 70% um, of ischemic stroke patients have hypertension. Um, and so it's really that kind of slowly over time injury to the blood vessels that doesn't cause it to burst, but sometimes it causes it to burst. And so you actually will have some patients that will have what um, ischemic as well as hemorrhagic strokes because of hypertension. Um, but it's that injury, that constant pressure and injury to the blood vessels that then causes clotting to happen over it. So I, I appreciate that question because it does uh, sometimes, you know, confuse people there. Um, how common is it to have an unresponsive uh, stroke patient? That's actually a good question too. You guys are right on it. All right, so syncope or syncope or passing out or being unconscious is actually not as frequent in ischemic stroke um, as many people think. It is actually, it, now, can I give you an exact percentage? No, I can't give you an exact percentage, but it's actually, when we hear somebody has had either syncope or become uh, completely unresponsive, we often start to question whether we think that it was a stroke, uh, a ischemic stroke, and actually worry if it has a hemorrhagic stroke because hemorrhagic strokes tend to cause increased intracranial pressure, which can cause people to pass out. Um, the other thing is though that basilar strokes in the back of the brain is the one time that you can find uh, people having, well, no, basilar uh, occlusions. And then if by the possibility that you have bilateral strokes, which are very rare, um, uh, then you could have people that are passing out or being really unresponsive. Um, if they get to a point that the only thing I will say, just because I'm trying to think about it from your perspective, if you were to find somebody later, they could have had a stroke and then had massive swelling that then caused them to become unresponsive. Um, so if, the, if it's not in that early period of time, you can really have it unresponsive. And again, I'm thinking of unresponsive as of the consciousness rather than the expressive aphasia or the, the language problem. But I love uh, how you're putting it in the context of how these how we see it in the field. And yeah, I think it's fair to say also that, you know, that the global unconsciousness, if you would agree, is relatively rare from stroke, as opposed to thinking about things like drugs, uh, sepsis. Or, or cardiac problems like cardiac. that's caused. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Hypotension yes. of a variety of causes. Yes. So relatively rare in ischemic stroke. Um, can you uh, address the role of temperature control? Uh, yeah, it seems like somebody must have looked looked me up. Uh, I uh, um, actually have a, a um, <laughs> an article about temperature control. So. Um, so one thing is, is that we, we found that uh, fever uh, leads to worse outcome in ischemic stroke. Um, the one thing that we don't know is hypothermia, if it actually affects outcomes of stroke or not. We know it does in cardiac ar uh, arrest. And the idea is that that's a, what we call a global ischemia. So it's, it's a period of time where the entire brain is not getting um, blood flow. But in a focal ischemia, which is ischemic stroke, we don't know exactly whether it works or not. There, again, are ongoing studies that are looking on endovascular cooling, helmet cooling, uh, a number of things that are looking at it, but they just haven't panned out to show true neuroprotection and improvement. I'm hopeful that they will. I think the concept is huge but it's not there yet. What we do at the University of Maryland is we make people normothermic. So if they are hyperthermic for whatever reason, we will cool them 
to keep them normal thermic at this time. I don't I know if I need a question in the chat to me. Given that clinically you can't tell the difference between hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke, is there a target blood pressure for EMS providers to achieve? Another very good question. All right. So uh, we believe that getting uh, that having a patient down to 180 over, um, uh, sorry, yeah, um, uh, to 180 over 100, let's 110. So 180 over 110, getting patients down to that uh, level is not bad for either hemorrhagic or uh, ischemic stroke because we can't treat somebody with IVTPA until they're lower than that level. Um, and, uh, and the same for hemorrhagic stroke. So if you have any uh, target, it would be 180 over 110, uh, but not lower than that um, because we don't know yet. Now, once we find out it's a hemorrhagic stroke, we lower it down. If we find out we can give IV TPA, we keep it right about there. If we find out we can't give TPA, then we actually allow it to rise up to as high as 220 over 110. Um, so we don't carry any medications to lower blood pressure. So I think okay. probably the more applicable would be a hypotensive patient and do you give them fluid or other medications to try to increase blood pressure. And again, the only medication we have to increase blood pressure that I can think of offhand is epi, epi drips. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, well, so we, uh, so one thing is almost never, unless somebody's floridly already in plural, you know, having plural fusions or, 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 or uh, heart failure, we actually um, uh, suggest people getting fluids. Um, we almost always do that to try to support their intravascular space, at least in that short, relatively short period of time. So we always would suggest uh, fluids. Um, pressers are hard because you're doing any sort of pressing because if it turns out to be a hemorrhagic stroke, you could really uh, injure them more. Um, so I think that until we have a little more information, unless they are uh, seemingly truly unstable, um, you know, below uh, a hundred systolic, then uh, I, I would really hesitate giving anything more to try to keep it up, at least at this time. Yeah, I think that, I think the protocol is 90 systolic and fluid is indicated, uh, but no, yeah, we would never start epi. That, that's, yeah. that's a no-go. But my colleagues did call me out and they're absolutely correct. We <laughs> do carry nitro paste for blood pressure issues. So thank you for that, you guys. No but nitro. that is no not, nitro. go ahead. Bad, bad for the brain, no nitro. <laughs> it's bad for the brain because? Um, uh, some, some studies have shown that it can cause problems with intracranial pressure. So uh, at this time, we don't recommend using uh, nitro for uh, in, in, in any cerebral vascular disease. Yeah, and that's it's actually on our board. That's not in the protocol either. Just yeah. So we're all on board here. Yeah, that's probably why you didn't think of it. <laughs> uh, um, comment on the above question on mode of patient transportation, helicopter versus ground. Is there a particular case? This, yeah, I can't, I don't know what case they're thinking about, but that's the question. Can he comment on the above question on mode of patient transportation, helicopter or ground? Um, so <clears throat> for- my perspective would truly be um, that uh, we want the patient there as fast as possible. We don't feel that the actual helicopter ride itself causes any problems. So if uh, we are doing transfers, we have a uh, helicopter first, unless they're unable to fly. Um, if you're talking about from the field, I mean, uh, whatever gets them there faster <laughs> and is safe um, uh, is, is what we, uh, we go for, we do actually have a whole um, spreadsheet for um, the distances by helicopter and by ground from different hospitals, other hospitals. And, um, uh, you know, some 
Some, if they can't fly, will actually ask them to try to go somewhere else uh, if, if, they're, if it's possible that they'll be closer by ground. I'm not sure if I was asking, answering that great yeah, question. You. Yep, that answers it, thank you. Yeah, and I think the other issue that we didn't explicitly touch upon is the, you know, the LVOT protocol Did we cover this is 22 hours um, is the cutoff to get to that center within 30 minutes, right? That 22 hours, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, essentially with the idea that we need the time to do some evaluation before the 24 hour cutoff, so yes. Right, and um, we're hearing a lot uh, about, unfortunately, hospitals that are sharing with us that our EMS crews, even after the rollout of the uh, bypass protocol, unfortunately, aren't catching these uh, high LAM score patients. And that obviously chews up a lot of time taking them to a center that is not thrombectomy capable. And then, then for that hospital to turn around, fly or dry or, or ambo the patient to um, a thrombectomy center, right? So we're still right. seeing that, unfortunately. So that's why these trainings are just so important. Yeah, and and I think you know, I know a lot of people are trying, uh, and and you know, I think some concept sometimes is that that you know the the stroke patient will be better at a comprehensive center, but also like I think we want to figure out if we can get the right patients at the right place, right? So that's why we're trying to use this lambs to do that, and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes. It looks like it's this and it's not. We understand that. That's not uh, a problem. But if we can try to get, if we try to get down to those missed ones, you know, we don't. I I don't think we have the expectation is going to be zero. But I think if we get it down to where we're at, you know, a low rate of those, it, it would be much better. A couple of other things. And do you have anything in your private chat to you? That's what I'm looking just now. Go, go ahead if there's- I put in the sign-in sheet, the link for everybody um, is in the chat in a couple of places now. I also, um, there's a free app that I like. I appreciate that Dr. Phipps provided a number of potential apps. I did put in here a screenshot of the app that I carry on my phone uh, in the chat as well. It's img1434.jpg. And that is called the Stroke Scales for EMS. It's a free app that has LAMS, RACE, CSTAT, FAST, EV, BAM. Obviously, LAMS and, you know, is the big one for us in the field, particularly with this new protocol. And what was the name again? I'm sorry. There. Let's see. Stroke Scales for EMS. Oh, great. Awesome. We'll I have another question for you. Can I challenge you just a little bit? And I hope you're not upset, but I think you do it every day, so you should be able to do this easily. Yeah. I think one of the things that EMS providers sometimes lack is a flow about them when they're confronted with a patient that they think had a stroke, right? So how do we get the Cincinnati and the LAMS, particularly now is more important, how do we get that and be fast, right? How do we get that in terms of the flow of doing that exam, right? Back to back to back. And what I struggle with personally sometimes is you know, some of these more, the, the cortical um, injuries around, you know, neglect and, and ga not gaze, um, neglect and, um, oh, visual field defects, right? That's not part of LAMS either, right? Right. So I, I still, though, I, my, my exam is a bit, not clunky because I've been doing it a lot, but you know what I mean? But you do as an expert. Do you have any suggestions for our providers on how to quickly do that? Yeah, um, I, I, I like the question. I, I think it's a little difficult because I do do it all the time. So uh, it, I, I recognize things so quickly. Um, sometimes I tell the residents that now I can do it from the door. You know, I almost don't have to, to go in and, and actually ask them to do some things because I observe what they're doing. Um, uh, yeah. and, but I will say one thing. One, one, I, let, me, let me say a couple things. Asking them to speak something specific, like what is your age or what is the month now, which is in the NI stroke scale, is I think can be very helpful because if you watch what they do when they do that, you listen and you watch their mouth, you can see a droop. You can also hear the dysarthria and hear if they're actually able to express anything or not and get it out. So that one question is, is one or two questions is very helpful. 
The other is that, and this is something that I don't, you know, I think that people think about strength and they have to like pull and pull on it. But the first thing that I do is I actually ask them to put both arms out just like this and close their eyes. And if they can follow that command to do that, you can right immediately see them drift or if they can't even get the other arm up. And then what I do is I put my fingers in their hand and say, grip me. So you would be able to get your lambs with those two things essentially, right? You can ask them to, to say what their age is or the month and then have them hold out and then grip and that will give you so much information. At the same time, you wanna see where their eyes are, right? If their eyes are way off and they're not coming around or they're looking one direction, that'll really help. And just that piece of information right there will give you a ton. If you really see that they you know, aren't moving anything on the one side, um, I, I think you'll quickly get that. It's when they're a little more subtle and in, in between that it becomes a bit more difficult. Excellent answer. There's a comment in the chat to me that says, this is the best stroke presentation ever I've, I've ever attended. Dr. Phipps covered many things useful in the pre-hospital setting. He's very good at communicating concepts to EMS providers. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm excited about this stuff, so I could keep going on. I don't, I just don't, I want you guys to be able to have dinner and, and you know, have your evening, but, but I, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying this, so. And I really do appreciate everybody participating. I know it's, uh, you know, it's kind of hard, but, but I think it gets your mind going and, and thinking about things when you're doing it. And, uh, and, and one thing I'm gonna ask you all, um, Dr. Baronholtz mentioned that sometime uh, maybe I could take a ride along. Um, so I would, be, uh, I would be honored if sometime I could, um, you know, uh, try to come do a ride along and, and then, you know, somebody was mentioning maybe uh, uh, observing over with us and seeing, you know, what, what happens in the in-hospital setting. All you have to do is see one thrombectomy that goes well and you'll, you'll understand. Um, and you'll also all remember, take this away. Just don't drop that blood pressure if you can, <laughs> you know, unless it's like so way out of whack, try to keep that blood pressure up because if any of that, you know, you try to sedate them because they're going crazy and everything, if you can do the lightest sedation, you know, whatever. I know it's, you gotta do what you gotta do to keep the patient safe, but if you just get that concept of not dropping the pressure, it's just really, really helpful. That's amazing, that's great. Any other questions from you guys? Oh, the other, just a brief story I wanted to share also to remind everyone is, you know, these calls don't always come out as patients who have stroke, right? Sometimes we get a call about a patient who's thinking they have a stroke, but you know, I, I, my perception is the bigger ones are, you know, the patient who fell, right? Or the patient, um, you know, yeah, so behavioral things also. And, and that even showing up, I showed up a couple months ago with, uh, I was riding at 325 in Pikesville and it was a fall patient and the guy was up against the corner of his door. And as soon as we went to go help him and to talk to him, we could hear that he was dysarthric and he wasn't moving the left side of his body, right? So it came out as a fall, but immediately it was like, holy moly, man, this is like a big stroke and we just need to move now. Uh, and that totally changed the pace. So yeah, so just, yeah, it's an important yeah. topic for all of us in EMS. Yeah, and that, that is, uh, I didn't get to go into that tonight. But even I am a little conflicted about some of those patients because we get some of the patients that come through shock trauma uh, and then we get called for them and they have a, a large lack on the head. And I sit there and go, well, let me just put it this way. I've treated those patients with TPA and um, I'll get like, you know, swollen up eye that they can't open and huge hematomas on their head. So, uh, if it happens on the outside, it's not so bad, but if it happens, if, you know, something happened on the inside and they bleed, it could be bad. So, but anyway, we still want to evaluate them as quickly as possible. So, um, 